Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Unlimited. Today, we are talking about leading with growth mindset. Now, I've talked about growth mindset a little bit before and the contrast to fixed mindset. This is a very popular topic in leadership development spaces, you know, talking about how one leads with an idea of an ability to grow, like that idea of failing forward. So whereas a mistake is simply an opportunity to learn. With fixed mindset, which is predominant in our society, there's this idea that we are born with fixed traits, a fixed level of intelligence, a fixed personality, that sort of thing. So, you know, some of the things that you might hear with fixed mindset are that you're either smart or you're dumb, you're either lazy or you're hardworking, you're either with us or you're against us. It's kind of this binary thinking, which is extremely prevalent. And even to the point that the person who wrote the book, Mindset, Carol S. Dweck, wrote an updated edition where she talks about false growth mindset because people were using essentially that binary of growth mindset versus fixed mindset as yet another binary of what's good and what's bad, fixed mindset being bad, growth mindset being good, but then using fixed mindset to play into growth mindset. Anyway, it's very uh, very hard to shift a mindset with just conceptualizing it. It takes taking action and essentially teaching your brain something different, which is the core of the work that I do when I work with clients. Not just the let's shift your mindset, but also let's take action that retrains your brain to be open to something new. I wanted to bring on someone who, in my opinion, really exemplifies leadership in growth mindset, and especially within a governmental standpoint, which is very dominated in particular, along with corporations, by this fixed mindset thing. Andre Vasquez is the 40th Ward Alderman, who is actually my alderman and was a friend prior to that. He is a lifelong Chicagoan, husband, father of two young children, and he was raised to believe in values like honesty, fairness, and integrity. But he wasn't raised to run for public office. In fact, for a long time, he didn't think his voice really mattered at all. He is the son of two immigrants, and he worked his way up to a senior management position at a major utility company, and then as a parent, became invested in the fight for better schools, city services, and the right allocation of resources in our city government. He began leading the call for progressive change with organizing meetings, block parties, and listening sessions. By going door-to-door and engaging in honest conversations with neighbors, Andre educated himself on the issues and core values that move our community. He won office election in 2019, unseating a nine-term incumbent. He believes we deserve transparent and accountable local government, and that when we stand together as neighbors, building an engaged grassroots community of citizens, we have the power to build a city that works for everyone. In this conversation, we explore and emphasize what it looks like to lead with growth mindset in life, as well as in government. Some of the things we talk about in this episode include owning your mistakes and making living amends, authentically and imperfectly showing up, normalizing self-doubt, playing to your strengths, owning your present moment, and being an activist outside and then inside the system. We also do get just a little Marvel nerdy, so... I know, you're shocked, (laughs) but prepare yourself. Before we get started, I do have a small favor to ask, and that is if you enjoy this episode, if you've enjoyed any previous episode, please share with others and let them know about this podcast. It does make a difference when you share with other people and we have more listeners to the podcast. So please don't be shy. Post on social media, send an email, hey, maybe even a phone call and let people know about the podcast and why you enjoy it and why you think they might enjoy it too. So now, without further ado, let's get started. 
Hey there, I'm Valerie Friedlander, Certified Life Business Alignment Coach, and this is Unlimited. This podcast bridges the individual and the societal, scientific and spiritual, positive and negative, nerdy and no, there's just a lot of nerdy. (laughs) Come on board and let's unlock a life that's as badass as you are. Welcome, Andre. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today. Hey, Mary. Thanks for having me on. Like, I'm excited to be here. Yay. So you and I have known each other for a little while now as neighbors and Mm -hmm. and then working on your campaign. I would love for you to share with the audience a little bit about you. Yeah. I uh, So I born and raised in Chicago, you know, a little bit of a not the ideal uh, environment growing up. Like my parents were immigrants. We were poor, got gentrified out of multiple neighborhoods, uh, worked retail most of my life. So not really involved in government or politics much at all. Uh, I think it really wasn't until my late twenties and thirties that I really intentionally started like learning more about politics. I think hip hop music when I was a kid influenced a lot of my perspective but it wasn't formally political until later on. And once I I met my wife and we had our kids, I then focused more on what I could leave behind for them. And that led to me community organizing and doing all the things and learning how much community can, uh, can heal and Mm. bring people together. And from, from, you know, something as small or, or maybe not as small as like putting together a block party, to like having these like block clubs and, and growing this stuff out. And, and that took me to a place where, you know, after a pretty tough election uh, and race, we were able to win and now govern through a pandemic, economic depression, civil unrest, and everything else we've got going on. So, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess time. Being a, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I guess uh, being a city kid prepared me for the kind of moment that we're in here. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> You were elected in 2019. So like this is kind of this really interesting time to come in and and be a leader uh, while everyone is just going, what is going on? This is terrible. Yeah. We met as neighbors when we when my husband and my family just moved to Chicago and you were someone who really helped us acclimate to the neighborhood and meet people and kind of get to know what was going on around this space, how we could get involved. And then all the the work in our block parties. And I've always found like you, you bring the fun into a space so that it's not as awkward to connect with people. So I wonder what has that been like for you, especially during this time to, to help people. There's a, I'm not really a big fan of this term, but the term that comes to mind is like raise their vibration as it were like yeah. to, to be able to, when everyone feels so depleted and so exhausted and weighed down with the, the world to help people re-energize, to be involved and harness the moment that we're in to actually make change happen. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you framing it that way. I think, um, I I always consider myself somewhat like a socially awkward extrovert, which is like (laughs) a weird mix. Um, But when I was like working retail jobs, like selling phones or a bookstore or whatnot, people would always comment on like, you've got so much passion and energy. And like, I've always had that kind of, yeah, vibe, but I also like feed off of it. So whenever I'm interacting with people, like I'm excited to hear about people's stories and perspectives. And I don't know if that's because when I was growing up, I wasn't very talkative or I wasn't really outgoing as much that now I I like, I draw enough joy and energy from it that it's second nature for me to put that back out. So even in a time where, you know, we are going through so many difficult things, I need that. Like when I, when I, now when I go visit a block party and I'm talking to everyone, that feeds my soul a bit and allows me to like bring that back to people. So I, I, I just think it's, it took me a while to figure that out. Now that I know that that's how I am, it's just a healthier way for me to kind of move. And, and I think people appreciate it and, and I do. So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship that I don't know that people get it. Mm. I, I get as much as I give when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. 
you know, that, I mean, that's kind of the definition of being extroverted, right? Like <laughs> being around right. people gives you that energy. I'm the same way. And I love that you put it in that way of like the socially awkward extrovert. Cause I definitely have felt that like I was not, I never felt like I fit in with spaces, but I wanted to, and I really like people. And then especially with the pandemic and then coming back and, and interacting with people, I'm like, I do not know how to interact around you. And I love yeah. your transparency with, within all the things of, of who you are, being willing to show up and just be like, this is where I'm at and it's not perfect. And I'm learning too. And kind of inviting people along with you. Like it, you make it so much more accessible to not know things, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Like it's okay yeah. to not know what you're doing and, um, or how to, how to be the person that you want to be, but just the striving for it is what really matters. Mm -hmm. And it creates a space for that to happen. I would love for you to share a little bit about like your journey with getting to a place where you were able to do that. You've had to do some of that in, in the public spotlight in a way that most of us don't have to. And that's yeah. been powerful to watch. Yeah. I, um, I think because, so I was one of those kids who like, didn't have friends and didn't talk to people up until maybe high school where you find like your crew of, of your, your Island of misfits that you're like, okay, this is, this is our people or whatever. Right. But what I noticed, and I, I've been very, when you're in that kind of space where you're not meeting people for that long, you become a lot more observant and also stuck in your head and sometimes reflective in good ways and bad ways. So I think for me, I've always kind of been able to, if anything, I used to feel like I was overthinking. Like I couldn't get out of my head when it came to stuff. Right. I think so that was, that felt like a challenge, but getting into rap music and then being able to get in front of people before I knew how to express myself and then deal with like my inner emotions from being outside of a community. The first thing that would come out would be angst and anger and like being the battle rapper kind of fit. And, and you know, some of us know through the election, like hip hop, and things that I had said at the time were like misogynistic and homophobic because rap music uh, carries a lot of that. So I think for me, I just saw it as a way to release this anger and angst that I had. And so when I think about how I've been able to channel that energy in ways that are more productive and ways that kind of show people where I come from, it's all part of the same story. So I can't negate the first part. And I think I, I feel like it's important to be very honest about how flawed we all are, that we are, we can choose to be works in progress. Um, and that, that requires being that frank, because I don't like the fact that people think politicians are special or should be on a pedestal when we're public servants and like the constituents are the ones who pay our salaries. And so I think that just, it makes perfect sense to be just straight up with people. And I think people appreciate that kind of vulnerability because they recognize that we are all like that. And it's when somebody pretends that they're not like that, that, that people give you kind of like the side eye. So I think that I'm very mindful of that and how I move. Yeah. Well, it helped you grow your awareness. And because a lot of people are doing a lot of work right now of, of trying to recognize the flaws, walk through the embarrassment, the shame of having been harmful and be able to find productive ways of making a difference, making an impact. I know a lot of the work that you've done as a public official has been to help support in places where you've found that you had done harm of like, you know, for example, helping uh, advocate for changing the word alderman to alder, or alder person, you know, to, to create more gender neutral, uh, inclusive verbiage for our political spaces and things like that. Um, I, but I wonder, like, before that, being able to acknowledge and then find those productive, those spaces of, of engaging your own development in a productive way of your own emotional self and in a productive way, what helped you with that? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of things. Like, I think I was heading in a trajectory that didn't feel healthy to me to the point that I, I definitely felt like I was rock, rock bottom. That like, you know, I had relationships that were falling apart. I didn't know what I was doing with my career. 
I had no idea what I was going to do in school. I had stopped going to college. I felt extremely lost and kind of internalized that and blamed myself for my decision making. So I think I definitely had the moment where I'm like, well, whatever my instinct tells me, I'm going to do the opposite and see how that works out. <laughs> and I saw that, in fact, it did open up some opportunities to be able to kind of move forward and do things. And, you know, the other component is the things that I said as a rapper that were harmful weren't in my heart. And I don't mean to like say that facetiously more than like, I had general angst in, in, in those feelings. I was trying to get out and channel it and direct in a certain way, but I still worked retail. And when you work retail jobs, you interact with every identity and everything on the planet. So I would be so cool with everybody while still, it, it was a conflict in me that I didn't really clarify. There was a dissonance there that thankfully I had a lot of patient people who were friends of mine who would help walk me through some of that. And then later on, as I became an organizer, part of organizing is being able to tell your story. And that is very much part of my story. And I would say, I always think about what were the things that caused me to be that way growing up? What was the context and the environment? And so when I think about changing the term alderman, the alder person, or having like uh, writing the ordinance that got us to put pronouns on our business cards and stuff like that, it's that context and, and, and people seeing that kind of language all over that influences people when you're younger. It's why I think teaching, you know, uh, real sex education and LGBTQ history in schools is important because when you learn that at a young age, it helps you move through the world. And then when you don't have that, you're left with opportunities to not necessarily be as inclusive as you can be. So I think, again, because I overthink everything, I'm always looking at it as like a puzzle. And I'm like, well, how do I solve the problem of what I went through? Okay, these are the things that I'd work on. And that kind of led me to make sure we were making inroads on those things. Yeah. Well, I, so I love that awareness because so often, especially in my industry, we talk, there's just so much focus on the individual. And I like to make sure that we're always recognizing that we exist in a societal context. Like a lot of what we take in and the ways that we learn to express what's going on inside of ourselves or not express what's going on inside of ourselves are things that we've picked up and that we've learned from the society around us. And so that acknowledgement of being able to look at it and go, okay, especially as someone who is representing people, taking it out of just that individual, like what is this societal situation? How can I impact that? And I think that even when you're not a representative, it's important to remember that because we can make such more effective approach to the the dynamics and the situations that we find ourselves in as individuals experiencing and relating to a societal context. You said something that really jumped out to me also within that of recognizing um, you know, the, the overthinking and one of the ways that yeah. I, I recommend talking about or encourage people when we talk about the, the overthinking is bringing people to the table. And that's been a big conversation recently, bringing people to the table and having those perspectives so that you're not just stuck inside of your head. And you've often referenced pulling from your experience in community and what community has meant to you and engaging that here as a representative, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, about that idea of bringing people to the table and having those conversations and building an active community. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting, right? Like we move in a society where we are very much feeling like it's an individualistic culture where I believe it needs to be a more communal one. And there are, there are byproducts of, of it being that way. So when, you're, when it's so individualistic, Everyone's in their head. Everyone's insecure and doubts themselves. Uh, everyone feels like when they make a mistake, it's the worst thing on the planet. Shame makes it feel like the world is imploding around you. But those are all things that you're, you are telling yourself how to feel or you're going through the process internally, which is why like, it might feel like into an individual that the world is imploding, but everyone else in the room has no, no idea. Like It's not that big a deal. And I think somewhere along the line or along my lifetime, what I recognized was everyone feels that way. 
everyone feels insecure. Everyone feels like their thing is the worst thing, that they're like doubting themselves. And typically people tend to overcompensate with how they present themselves. So if you've got somebody who's like super confident and like smug or whatever, they could be really insecure behind that wall they put up. And for me, some of that root cause was feeling like you're not part of a community. Like when you feel like you're isolated from a community, you're excluded out, you ruminate in those thoughts. And if anything, you might try to find other people and create your own subculture that then is resentful of the larger group. So we do all these things to divide each other and none of those things solve the problem. So again, when I look at like the puzzle, I'm like, well, the way to solve that is by making it intentionally inclusive where everyone comes to the table and have those conversations. And you can have a conversation about how you feel and your doubts and find that other people share those commonalities, which then removes the stigma you've got associated with yourself, right? And, and that for me has always grounded me in the moments where I most feel insecure or have those doubts, where I go, well, so does everybody else. So that means I'm normal because we're all doubting ourselves. So fine, let's keep going. Um, and that's, it served me well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very much so, because as I mentioned, that has been one of the things that I've admired as you, you get up and, and share and knock on doors and bring people together. And that was, that was the root of your campaigning and, and your Mm -hmm. activism was going door to door and building that community. And you have mentioned, you know, a lot of the things that we've, we've talked about on this show, the idea of, being able to recognize, like, even when you think that you've pivoted in your life where you've let go, like, okay, well, I'm not doing that career anymore. I'm doing this career. And Mm -hmm. I I've talked to a lot of people who feel this, like, oh, I, I wasted my time. And it's like, no, actually like what you pull from those experiences feed into new spaces and you never know exactly what those things will bring. One of the things that I've I've seen you, Paul, is, you know, being able to speak and, and be quick on your feet, like you just kind of improvise. And I would imagine that that comes from a lot of that practice in rap battling and yeah. being able to just like, okay, we're just going to roll with this. What do you, what do you got for me? And being able to be vulnerable now, like infusing the two together allows for some really powerful speaking. What else have you pulled from your history that, or your experience that you feel has really helped you in the work that you do now? So that's, that's a tough one because <laughs> everything does, right? And I guess, I, I think to your point, I also felt that way. Like I, I was, I wanted to be an English teacher when I first, like, you know, when you ask, well, first it was a zoologist when you were a kid, but then it was English <laughs> teacher, right? And that's what I thought I was going to college for. And so I found myself at a crossroads where I was starting to tour nationally as a rapper while also going to school to try to be an English teacher and also working at a cell phone company selling phones. And so I felt myself really trying to figure out, like, where am I going? Like, uh, rappers don't get 401ks uh, or health insurance. And I was making more money selling phones than I would have made becoming a teacher. And I wouldn't have incurred the the amount of debt one does when you go to school, right? So I was very confused during that time and I was beating myself up over it. And I think ultimately what happens is we're so busy thinking about the alternative universe rather than living in the world that we're actually in and the moment that we're in, that the resentment actually keeps you from progress, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you can go into whatever field you want, bringing your experience and perspective to it. And you'll bring things to that career, that path that no one else can bring. And there's a reason why you can bring that and why you're there in that moment. But if you're busy beating yourself up over the fact that you're not where you thought you were going to be, you're not in the moment. Like, I, you know, I started going to therapy. I mean, I, I went a couple of times, but I started really more fully in January where like I have a regular therapist I talk to every Monday and this concept of like the, the, the universe is, is nuts. Like you'll get something from like a TikTok video that'll like explain things that you're just like, I had never thought of it that way. So I, I got to this concept of thinking of like my mind is like a time machine. And what I mean by that is like, 
you spend all your time thinking about your past. So there's all this regret that you're working through or you're busy worried about the future. So there's all this anxiety about the future rather than being in the moment. And so every time when I feel either anxiety or resentment or whatever those things are, I have to take the second to go, am I in the moment right now? Or am I like in the wrong place in time mentally? Like, let me center myself. And it helps me go through that because if anyone would have come to me as like a teenager and said, you're going to be an elected official and city council, I would have laughed in your face. And now I'm in this position, having drawn from all of my experience, the gentrification, being a person of color, work in retail 20 years, and all those things have informed me to actually be better in the role that I'm at. Uh, and I think that's something that people should be mindful of. You can always think about what could have been, you don't know that it could have been had you chosen that path. You could find yourself that that didn't work out, but where you're at now is important. And you should appreciate that because everyone's in a different place in their journey and the journey is not over. Yeah. All those moments, all those times of, okay, now let me, uh, like, I have no idea where I'm going, but I'm going somewhere and kind of trusting your own process is powerful, but it's very, very difficult as, as you're talking. Cause I know you're a fellow nerd. I'm thinking there, there's a reason why they're only doing like one little bit around what if in the Marvel universe and not mm-hmm. spending like all the time, <laughs> like just imagining all the different scenarios that we could have just a little bit of time. It yeah. reminds me of, of a, something I was told a while ago of like, you don't want to spend a ton of time sitting on the pity pot. But, you know, if you need to sit on the pity pot, like give yourself a little bit of time, right? just like, you know, set a timer. You can sit on the pity pot for like five minutes and then you need to get up and go about your business. Yeah. I think, I think fully like you can't suppress those feelings because they only come out one way or the other somewhere else. Yeah. So you should tell yourself, Hey, here's a time where I'm going to take to do that. And also what if is amazing, by the way, yes. I've been watching <laughs> two of them. but the thing that I was going to say that that was funny to me is 50 Cent. So 50 Cent, the rapper, right? Yeah. Uh, there's also an author by the name of Robert Greene who wrote The 48 Laws of Power, which is like, it's like this uh, book that talks to like how you succeed and achieve power in environments. And it's just, it's a very interesting read. So somehow the author of that best selling book and 50 Cent linked up and they wrote a book called The 50th Law. And The 50th Law, what, 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 Robert Greene does is he focuses on historical figures, what they've done and how they followed laws that he's written in order to be successful. And for 50, there was a whole new law of like his fearlessness. We're talking about a rapper who was shot nine times and was able to survive all that. And how once he made it from that experience, he had no fear about anywhere you put him in. You could put him in a business boardroom. You could put him in the recording studio. And the thing about having that sort of fearlessness, it's a confidence that you'll figure it out no matter where you're at, if you like focus on doing so. So I think for the, for the pity pot conversation, when you're using so much of your mental energy on all these other things and letting your fear kind of take you there, as opposed to utilizing your full energy on what you can do to move yourself forward, not, not focusing on how to move forward is what sets you back. So it's very interesting I, when I read those, I was like, it's really weird that I'm learning from rappers about this stuff, but it does apply in all those different contexts. Yeah. Well, that, that actually makes a lot of sense to me in that it's owning, it's like owning your power. It's owning yourself versus, you know, trying to be someone that you're not, or trying to be somewhere that you're not. It's like owning where you are. It's owning this present moment as the person that you are being the accumulation of all of these experiences and people and all of these things that have come into you in this moment. And, and that's actually something that I very much have seen you do as you stand and speak and interact, like whether you're on stage or whether you're interacting with people knocking door to door and just showing up with all that full authenticity. I think that's something that I've seen you harness really powerfully. And I'm curious because 
because you've gone from, I mean, all of these experiences and and then moving into activism, one of the things that I, I see a lot and I'll talk a lot about is like the energy that you show up with and the way that you show up. So there's there being that being self-possessed and then taking that and knowing the kind of energy to show up with in the given situation that you're in, not in a way that's necessarily like, um, like I have a whole episode where we're talking about the idea of tact and and the, the problematic nature of like trying to make other people comfortable, but yeah. being able to engage in a powerful way with another human being or group of humans and That's something that you've had to navigate within being an activist outside the system and then being an activist inside the system. And it seems like, you know, you've you've gotten flack from people for some of the things of like not being the same way you were outside the system as inside the system. Mm -hmm. But there's always this movement forward. I'm just I'm really curious about like, what has that been like for you to be an activist in both spaces? Yeah, no, it's um, it's challenging, but um, I think my experience again has kind of put me in a position where I can kind of maneuver through that. And what I mean by that is like, in order for me to have succeeded in a corporate environment, because I worked for AT and T for twelve years, um, after being a rapper for fifteen years, I had to learn, and I did learn through life how to code switch, like how to be able to articulate things based on the audience I'm in front of. And I, I very much, when I was first understanding this or starting to understand it, I would, I, I was scared because I thought I was going to lose myself. Like if I'm this person in this room and this person in that room, like who am I at my core? And I had to really reconcile that and understand that what I was doing was translation. It's how am I in a space to articulate the thoughts and feelings I have to the group here in a way that they're going to hear it. And so it is more this idea of knowing how to read the room and being able to, to move things. There's an author by the name of Tressie McMillan. There was um, an interview with Ezra Klein that I listened to where she does a really perfect job of explaining that there are people who are able to kind of be in those different spaces because they're aware of status and how they need to be in those spaces to move things along. And there aren't that many people who are that comfortable doing so. So I kind of viewed it again when we're talking Marvel as like the mutant power of like, okay, I I can do this. So rather than feeling like I'm disjointed, I know who I am and I can help move those things. Now, when it comes to, you know, being an activist prior to being in office and then being in office and trying to figure out how to affect change, that was tough. When you're outside of the room trying to get in, you're beating on that door and adding as much pressure as you can to be heard. Once you're in that room, that same energy is actually counterproductive. You know, meaning like when I get to city council, I then have 49 other colleagues and a mayor that if I come in with that same energy, I will very likely push away a majority of people rather than working to build the coalitions necessary to get a number of votes to move something. And so I view it more as like part of what the role actually is. An activist should be the one applying pressure as the public has demands. And then the person, once you're in, has to figure out How do you deliver on that? Because I could do all the yelling for the elected officials to make change before I get in it. But once you're in there and now you're the elected official, it's incumbent upon you to actually work to get it done, not just yell about how you can't get it done. And so that does come with some level of risk. It does come with people who won't understand that, don't want to understand it, don't care to understand it. And I knew coming into this role, it would invite critique. But while my truth is, and my hope is that people see the whole body of work. So I, I think something you mentioned earlier when we were talking about like kind of like thinking large but being grounded. For me, I always say like, I know what my North Star is, but I also have to look at the waters I have to navigate to get towards it. And if I stay looking at the North Star, I'm going to crash into something in front of me. So it's about having that wherewithal of like understanding that you have to take steps to get to where you want to get. Mm, yeah. One, one paddle at a time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. So knowing that everyone has their own mutant power as it were, like we all have our gifts that we, we have to bring to the table and how important it is for someone 
who has experience of the, you know, banging on the door to be able to have representation so that you, you have an understanding of what they're banging about, right? Like, why are they at the door? And, and I thought, you know, it was so well articulated in Falcon Winter Soldier where, you know, there's that moment of like, well, why are these people here? Like, you can't just ignore that. There's a reason why people are, are reaching out. There's a reason why people are willing to do what they're doing at great right. risk to themselves to be able to be heard. And are you actually hearing them? And so having people representing in a way that actually is, I'm, I am listening to this mm -hmm. and I am listening to you, even if it's not as fast as, as you want it, but I can hear, I can hear you and I can translate and, right. and help make things move forward. We need more people like you. We need more representation of diverse groups, people who will are willing to hear and able to hear and and do the work in government. So anyone who is interested in being involved, what would you want to tell them? So it, it's weird because of how I got involved, which was its own roller coaster, right? Like for me, it was very much Bernie Sanders getting me so amped up and excited that I was sharing stuff on social media and then was able to get connected to meet Bernie. And at that point was like, when does that happen in a reality? I guess I got to go do a thing now. Um, <laughs> but I, I think for, for, for people, I think the first step is to reach out to those folks that are most involved with the issues that you're passionate about. Like if there are things that you want to change at a government level, at a city level, like, Go reach out to your city council member and have those conversations and find out if they are someone who is willing to interact and to build coalition. I think, like we were just mentioning, like between my role as now as a legislator and an activist, you know, somebody outside of the room, we have to learn how to coordinate to get things done. And so I, I think that anyone who wants to get involved to take those steps to find the stakeholders that are most interested in doing the work is a good way to start. Ask somebody out for coffee or like a meeting and just kind of get a sense of who they are, how they got to where they got. And, and that information is helpful. I think the challenge is not everyone is like us, like some of us, right? Like I, I come in wanting to be that kind of elected official, but people very justifiably don't trust elected officials. So I get why there's a hesitance there. But if you ultimately go in there, especially if they're the ones that you vote for, Mm -hmm. You'll find out how much power you have in that relationship. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I really appreciate your time and being here and having this conversation. I like to wrap up conversations with a couple questions. The first yeah. being, what does it mean to you to be unlimited? <laughs> I always feel drained. So that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think for me, it's about the conversations I have with myself. And what I mean by that is the person who's most, who has the most power to limit somebody, I believe is themselves, is that person that to be unlimited is to not stop myself, right? If you tell yourself you can't do something, you're not going to do it. If you make yourself, you push yourself and have no limits, like you get further. Like I just learned how to ride a bike this weekend and I'm 42 years old. That means for 41 years, I limited myself from even getting on because I was scared I was going to fall or whatnot. I did that to myself. So being unlimited is not doing that to yourself because there's so much potential that you have and it's that doubt that keeps you from fulfilling it. Yeah. And when you want to feel unlimited, what song do you listen to? Oh, man. I cannot answer that only because I tend to have playlists of like hundreds of songs. So like as a rapper and like a, a music guy, like that's what I'll do. I have my playlist while I'm working. So there's like soul records, R&B records, hip hop records. I don't know that I could pick just one. <laughs> I've, I've definitely had a number of people kind of go, well, can I give you three? <laughs> Which is totally fine because ultimately what this is going into is a playlist of songs that help people feel unlimited. 
Well, what I could do is I could send you a link to the, one of the playlists I have and see if there's stuff there people dig. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. I would link that in the show notes so people could go listen. Is there one or two that really jump out to you right now? Like maybe that in yeah. right now is speaking so, to you. I think the one that I, I play a lot since I got in the office is it's a uh, give the people what they want by the OJs. So it sounds like this like funk record. And then it isn't until you dig in deeper and like listen to the words. They're like, oh, this is like a, a revolutionary record. Or it's like it's a democratic one, even though it sounds like a DJ taking a request, give the people what they want. So I think that's a that's when I play a lot since I got in the office. Awesome. I love it. Thank you again. And we'll have links in the show notes where people can connect with you, learn more about your website stuff. And of course that playlist. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. I, I really appreciated it. Thanks for listening. I so appreciate you being here. If you got something out of today's episode, please share it. Leave me a review, take a screenshot and post it on social with a shout out to me. Send it to a friend or, you know, all of the above. Want to hang out more? Join me on Instagram. Or better yet, get on my mailing list to make sure you don't miss out on anything. And remember, your possibilities are as unlimited as you are. Allow yourself to shine, my friend. The world needs your light. See you next time.